Good evening. I'm Dr. Patrice Lawrence and welcome to this evening's episode of HealthWise. I'll be your host for this evening. We have an interesting lineup tonight. We're going to take a look at the topic of childhood obesity. So we talked a little bit about obesity in adults last week. This week we're going to focus a little bit on the children and what we can be doing to help them deal with this common problem that we have in the the Caribbean. With me tonight I have as my co-host Dr. Monique Lescott. Um, say good night Dr. Lescott. Mm -hmm. Good night everyone out there in TV and YouTube land. Welcome back to our show. And for this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about childhood obesity, as we mentioned. We'll also talk a little bit about what's been happening at the JNF Hospital and speak about our local our spotlight for this evening. But for now, let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. Um, thanks for tuning in. I hope they have it, you know. I hope they have it. How can I help you today? Yes, I've been searching for this medication everywhere and no one seems to have it. Please tell me that you do. You've come to the right place. We have just what you need. And even if we're out of stock of the item, as soon as it comes in, we will notify you. Thank you. Best with Pharmacy. Always taking care of all your pharmaceutical needs. Good evening once again and welcome back to HealthWise. We're discussing tonight about childhood obesity with my co-host, Dr. Monique Lescott. So Dr. Lescott, childhood obesity, let's get, go ahead and get started with our first slide. Why is childhood obesity such an important issue in the Caribbean today? First of all, let's point out that the amount of persons who have been diagnosed with overweight or obesity is increasing every single year. So right now we're up to about 25% of children being overweight or obese. Hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Well, um, it's really important to establish healthy eating habits even as a child is even as young as preschool. But sometimes I find, I guess, to placate the child or to comfort the child per se, some parents will give in and um, allow snacks. Most likely, most times is what I observe is the unhealthy kind of snacks. Um, so I think stuff like this is what is contributing to juvenile obesity. Um, and I feel like a lot of the youths right now don't do a lot of outdoor activities like before. Um, parenting has, I guess, more or less, before they used to accuse the parents of having the TV babysit the children, now it's the tablet and the smartphones. Yes, that's So the true. children are no longer going outside and running around on, I guess, on a weekend. They probably stay inside more often than before, whereas before I think, I think we used to look forward to the weekends to kind of run loose and do what we want. Right now the kids are staying inside, they don't that's want to true. sweat, probably not drinking enough water. So it's a very prevalent problem. I agree um, with the social media usage and the usage of screens. I think when we were children, we would spend a little time watching TV and a lot of time playing outside. outside. But now it seems to me the opposite, where there's a lot of time spent with these screens. Stagnant. Yeah. And when you're on the screen, there's one thing you're not doing is moving, moving around. around. So that ties us back into obesity. The the main causes being eating more than is necessary combined with moving less than your body needs and probably too much sugary stuff starches that would um store in the body as fat and sometimes um, we're not doing the children any favors by not feeding them nutritious food and then i think sometimes there's probably a def deficit in because i think some parents take it for granted that the children need supplementary vitamins and stuff like when i speak to parents i don't think um some of the ones that i spoke with before they don't really see taking vitamins or insisting that the child takes supplementary vitamins each day as a must they kind of see it as optional when it's really 
It's really not. It's, it's not optional. And even in the absence of vitamins and supplements, um, just the basic of ensuring your children are having a certain amount of fruits and vegetables every day, um, that frequently is not being met. Because in this economy that we're currently in, we know that fruits and vegetables are the, expensive. the most expensive option. That's true. So we do tend to lean a lot on convenience foods, the chips, the crackers, um, the white flour, the juices, macaroni, macaroni, all of these convenience foods that were not, let's be honest, were not built with health in mind. They were made with convenience, convenience. in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think we are all suffering, both children and adults. Uh, one of the big dangers with childhood obesity, it is linked to adult obesity. But um, another huge issue that we're coming across is that children with obesity are developing these adult illnesses, things like cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, depression. cancers, as well as it affects them socially in terms of their mental health with depression, bullying. These are things that we're going to look into a little bit this evening. Let's go to the next slide. So why is childhood obesity an issue? We started talking a little bit about this, Dr. Lescott. Let's talk a little bit about the emotional and behavioral aspects of childhood obesity. Um, sometimes I feel like um, children can be a bit cruel on the, the, the playground and can probably be less kind to children that might be overweight. And so what I notice is sometimes when a child is struggling with self-esteem issues, they're liable to perform less. This might be an otherwise very brilliant child, but because of the teasing and the bullying, sometimes I guess their mind becomes preoccupied with that more than focusing on the task at hand, which is their schoolwork. So then in the long run, sometimes their schoolwork can suffer. And in fact, you know, sometimes we see children that start out active and social and happy and playful and then as they gain weight and they're able to do less and play less, they see a shift in the personality. They become more subdued um, and they're less willing to socialize with their peers. And the bullying, as you said, can be quite severe. And that's something that does have long-term effects on a child well into adulthood. Some children, their self-esteem, they would require a lot of work to recover it to where it should be based on the, the emotional impact of being obese as a child. Sometimes I think too, after the child, because you know, once they a young baby, even up until infancy, they have regular clinics where you have to check the weight and what's not. And I think after that, the parents, I don't think a parent knows what, some parents, sorry, don't know what is the healthy weight of a five-year-old or healthy portions even. Sometimes the way how I see them portion the food, it's too much, a, a, a child's tummy is even not as big as your, your fist. So can you, if you can imagine that for a minute, you have to watch the portions of foods that you give them. So one, I don't think that they are aware of what is the healthy weight range for their child as the child grows past infancy. And two, I don't think they really take time to consider proportion sizes in the meals when they're preparing the meals for the children. So I think that's something we can look into. Yes, I 100% agree. Um, educating the parents is so important so that they know what to expect in terms of what a healthy child should look like, weigh, be doing, be eating, so on and so forth. That's why these forums are so important so that we can um, ensure our parents know what to look out for. Um, when we talk a little bit about some of the complications of being obese as a child, we spoke about the risk of cardiovascular disease, the risk of high blood pressure. I think a lot of people don't realize that even as a child, when you're take in, taking an excessive unhealthy food, you do end up with these lifestyle problems. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a shift in recent years where many of the illnesses we've never seen in children are, are now being seen in children very commonly because of these dietary and weight issues. What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Lescott? Um, well, that's definitely um, something that I've also noticed. One thing that always takes me by surprise is the prevalence of juvenile diabetes 
even here in the Federation, I've known of children to have diabetes or develop diabetes really young, like primary school and that sort of thing. I, I've um, heard of one or two cases, and I don't think in times past we would have heard such. So it was a bit, I, I wouldn't say, it was a bit of a shock for me to, to, to know that these lifestyle issues can develop so young. And so the child now is not able to play and socialize as other children because they're on a strict regiment so when other children are having snack time, they can't have the same snacks anymore. Yes. So it's a very inclusive, sorry, the, uh, exclusive condition for them. I mean, the children, when they're just going into school, they're just learning the parameters of socializing. So then they already start off feeling excluded because they already notice that their regiment is different from other children and they probably from what I, I gather, don't have the same amount of energy. Once they have diabetes setting in early, they don't have the same zeal as other children. Yes, That's yes, a good yes. way to put it, because then they would be um, a bit, I think, more lethargic. Oh, that's how I see them. Um, that's so true. Um, it does have implications in their behavior and their energy levels and, as we said, their socialization. So then I wonder so, how it affects them on a cognitive level because I can see that they're a bit lethargic. I don't like using the word slow for children. Yes. I would think that they would have cognitive brain fog. I suspect they won't be able to um, process things in a clear manner. Yes, I think we've seen. Let's stick a pin there and discuss that a little bit more after our first commercial break. It's time that we realize that we must work together to thrive. The world as we know it, the sky and below it. Could I never have more wonder? Yeah, with life and all you see, and the climate's changing. But hope is remaining. And we can't ignore the future, it depends on you and me. One chance, all that we got. One voice, together we start. Take care. Yeah, man. Another day in the box. Well, hello, dear. Ooh, she pretty from head to toe, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> Wait there. Can't afford to sleep up. Not even in my dreams. Good evening everyone and welcome back to our show HealthWise. We're on the topic of childhood obesity this evening. Uh, before the break we were talking a little bit about how juvenile diabetes in obese children can affect them cognitively. 
Dr. Lescott, I'd let you finish your thoughts on that. Yeah, I was saying because um, diabetes can sometimes come and um, present with low energy at times because it's a very regimented uh, diet that um, diabetes requires. So um, from what I observe in youths who have juvenile diabetes, sometimes they're not able to keep up with other children, mentally speaking, because I feel like they suffer from brain fog. I don't, I don't think it's something that they um, are in control of. They can't help it. It's, it's, it's a part of the condition. Um, and we could see delays in terms of their development, um, poor grades in school, as well as even just being ill with diabetes and the effect it has on your health can lead to greater school absences. Um, obesity can also lead to school absences as children are more prone to illnesses as well. Even stuff like breathing difficulties, that's a big one because we already have a very high prevalence of asthma and so can you imagine if you have a double whammy of asthma and obesity so then it means that the child is in a much huger greater risk to develop respiratory distress for even simple activities. Yes, that is something that we have seen quite commonly. So we've seen some of the dangers of childhood obesity. Let's talk a little bit more about what's cause, what causes it. Let's go to the next slide, number four. So at its essence, weight gain is caused, as we said, by eating more than is needed and not doing enough physical activity. So we have diet, we have activity, and then there are other factors such as poverty, the walk of walkability of neighborhoods, the ability of them to play in their neighborhood, their social interactions, their, their community group in terms of who they can play with, um, and so on and so forth. So let's talk a little bit first about diet, Dr. Lescott. We mentioned sugary drinks. Um, what other factors can you identify? Well, right now, many parents are not in a position like before. We don't have a lot of stay-at-home moms. I don't think that, um, as you say, these people are making the foods for the nutritional value. It's about convenience. So it's probably more convenient to say do about a pack of ramen or some macaroni. And as we say, it stops a gap. But it stops a gap and then creates another gap elsewhere. And so we find that is where a lot of the problem lies. We have both parents in the home that works. And so there are not many options for the children to choose healthier because it's not presented to them. And I think it's, it represents a societal shift as well. Less time in the kitchen, but also we're not as connected to nature as nature. we once were. Um, the farming, it's not as easy to get fresh fruits and vegetables. It's not as easy to get produce. Um, when I was growing up, I can remember, you just go outside and find a fruit tree. There is no, you never needed to go to the supermarket to get fruits necessarily. Yeah. Um, you could get vegetables and produce from neighbors who farm. People gave each other their excess produce that they grew in their gardens. And now I would say we're a lot further removed from that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that affects the diet, definitely, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, in terms of, I guess we have more single parent homes as well. I mean, there's two dynamics. We have the, the parents that both are present, but then they're both working. And then there's another dynamic where it's one parent and that one parent is always also working. Yes. So there's a lot of absent I won't call it absent period parenting because I don't think that's what that is if you have to go out to earn a living, but there is um, a prevalence right now of children being left more and more to themselves. So I, obviously if they're home by themselves, they're gonna choose to eat what they like and not necessarily what an adult would recommend. So it's important to have the foods that are they can fix for themselves, make it healthy choices, or else children would choose to eat a candy bar for dinner. We yes, know this. Yes, for sure. <laughs> they will choose the fun foods over the healthier options every time. Definitely. So prep work definitely factors a lot into that. But we are all in this busy lifestyle. So 
I think, as we said, prep work, that's a huge part of it. If you plan to give your children these healthy foods and you prepare in advance so that that's the, that becomes the most convenient option in the moment, I think that would be very helpful. Sometimes, too, when you start children off eating lots of sweets and sugary stuff, on they, even if you try to change that dynamic even a few years after it becomes like pulling teeth because they already the palate is already accustomed so then if you try to get them to choose a cucumber over a lollipop they'll choose the lollipop because that's what you started them off because i've seen the opposite to be true in some children where the parents didn't give them a lot of sugary stuff so then when you do offer them that they don't like it that's true they don't like it they wouldn't so it's about how you train them, I think. Yes, yeah, so those with younger children, that's an important note as well. Um, offer them the fruits and vegetables from very young so that they become accustomed to the flavor. And when they're older, we would hope that they would choose those foods more when given the option. Let's talk a little bit about physical activity, Dr. Lescott. Mm -hmm. The current recommendation is at least an hour of physical activity every day per child. Is that feasible in our modern day? It can be because, I mean, they still do breaks and I'm not sure if they allow too much device devices because I think some schools don't allow children to bring their smartphones or their tablets to school. So I think something like this, maybe the schools can get on board if they have not already. I'm not sure if they had. If they have someone from the public, they can um, let us know if they have. Um, I don't know if primary schools have a PE Regimen yes, yes. Do? there's still a PE regimen. Um, some it varies in terms of the school how often they might do the PE and how long that is for. But most schools they still have their break periods. They still have their PE, and I think that's a good opportunity to get children moving. That's very important as well. But I think a huge aspect as well is the after-school play, the outdoor play. Um, the screens are very appealing to the children. However, when they have friends and there's activities outside, having them play outside is a lot healthier for them than having them sit inside with the screens. I agree. It's, it's not good for their eyes either, for their young eyes. I feel like we're going to have a, a problem in a few years with the blue screen. We're going to probably have more and more young people wearing spectacles because of the amount of screen time they have exposed their eyes to from a very early age. Yes. So, um, in terms of the activities in the, in the school itself, I, you're saying that they still do PE activities, but I'm not sure then what else the school can do to make physical activity more incorporated because... Actually, the after-school activities would be uh, an exciting option as well. Um, the children that play football and they do track are noticeably fitter than those who are not involved in an active extracurricular activity. So I think that's another important point of focus for a parent that's concerned about obesity in their child. Yes, PE, but I'd also choose extracurricular activities that are more active. At that, let's take a short commercial break and we'll be back with you in a moment. At Bestaway Medical, we are dedicated to meeting all your medical needs. Our friendly staff is always available and ready to assist. Our trusted physician is also equipped with the knowledge and expertise to best serve you. Make Bestaway Medical your medical center of choice. Join us on ZIZ TV for Youth Lounge with Skonaipo, a talk show on vital topics such as tourism, entrepreneurship, education, religion, sex education, and mental health. Featuring experts from St. Kitts and Nevis and the Caribbean region. Tune in live on the first and third Wednesday of every month at 8.30 p.m. on ZIZ TV. What did you mean earlier about climate change, Mom? Well, when I was your age, I remember beautiful coral reefs, 
and healthy beaches. The summers weren't as hot as they are right now and the rainy season meant that it only rained when it was supposed to. And then what happened? The weather just started to change and storms got worse. Coral reefs started to die because the ocean was getting too warm and crops started to die because there was not much rain. You know, we realized as adults that we were doing something that was causing this. What were you all doing? The same thing we're doing now. Not using clean, renewable energy, chopping down too many trees, and even polluting the air with gases, such as the gases emitted from our cars when we drive around. We need to help before it's too late, Mom. We can't let it get worse. What can I do? We can raise our voices. With 35 million dreams, aspirations, and futures at risk in Cari Forum, we need your voice in our story against climate change. Acknowledge. Commit. Act. This message is brought to you by the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center under the Intra-ACP Global Climate Change Alliance Plus program and is funded by the European Union. Good evening and welcome back to HealthWise. We're having an interesting discussion this evening about childhood obesity. Before the break, we were talking a bit about physical activity. If you could pull up slide six, we'll discuss that a bit more. So physical activity is very beneficial. Not only does it help to counterbalance the food that we're taking in to maintain a healthy weight, but it improves the health of their, the children overall improves heart health, strengthens the muscles and bones, helps them to sleep better, which I think every parent wants their children to sleep at night. Okay. And having them run around is one of the best ways to ensure they do that. It improves the mood of the children and helps relieve their stress and has social benefits in terms of helping children to socialize and build connections with peers of their age range. The recommendation is to be active at least 60 minutes a day for children including moderate and vigorous physical activity. And it's also recommend that, recommended that they participate in different types of activities, such as running, jumping, um, that work different muscle groups and work the brain in different ways as well. Do we have any, um, for instance, if we want to test the fitness of an adult, they would go to a doctor and they would hook them up to a treadmill, you know, the fitness test. Yes, the stress test. Do we do that with children? Is, I've, or is there a way to safely do that? Because then it's one thing to recommend that they do fitness things, but we also need to make sure that they're fit for the activities so that we don't run ourselves in. Because I'm looking at it from a caretaker's point of view. They're not going to be in the care of their parents all the time. True. So if I'm a teacher, and I'm thinking, well, I want to help this child to become more active. And then next thing you know, the person um, starts having um, respiratory distress because the activity was too much and that sort of thing. Maybe we can come up with some sort of way to kind of, it's not going to be a, 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 a outright fitness test like what we have in labs. But, but a some, way to ensure way that to activity assess. is safe for them. <laughs> yeah, because yes. you know, we had an incident, and I don't mean to rub salt in anybody's wounds, and it's my sincerest condolences of the young man. He was in school, and he didn't return the same way his mom sent him to school. He went on the steeplechase, and I could imagine that's very traumatic for the children, and it would have been traumatic for me if I was a teacher. And so I wasn't sure if we have any ways in the public sphere system when we're dealing with children how to assess their relative fitness for certain activities because we don't want any more mishaps. That's an important point to make. I think with all physical activities important to ensure we're doing it safely um, and starting gradually if they're not accustomed to it. But for the, most, the majority of children I think activity would be beneficial for them barring um, severe underlying health conditions. But you know what is the issue? If, the, if it is the children 
are being encouraged to have more activity that means the parents will have to be the one to come and, and I think we run into that that problem very <laughs> which brings up another point that I've noticed in St. Kitts it can be quite difficult for children to get outside and play um, in terms of having that somebody observe them the safety of the neighborhoods um, the traffic that might be close by so I think an abundance of safe spaces for play we areas need for safe children spaces because the parents they're tired. So can you imagine you you work how many hours shift and this child just has all the energy in the world waiting for you to come home. Mommy, mommy, let's go outside and play. It makes you want to go right back out the door sometimes. <gasps> but it is important <laughs> to ensure that we do take a little time to allow children to do that. Mm -hmm. that's true. So that's quite important. Let's go to the next slide. And as we said, there are barriers that stop some children from being able to participate in physical activity. Awareness is key. Once we're aware of some of the things that might prevent them from doing so, the more we can kind of learn how to work away those things. So not enough time. You know, there's homework. They have to get make their way to and from school. And as we said, the parents have, don't have enough time. Poor health or disability, which we touched on as well. Um, if they have underlying health conditions that can prevent them to, from doing physical activities. Not having anyone to go with. There is a social aspect to play. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to get a child to go outside and play alone. Mm -hmm. So really focusing on a community effort to have children playing and encourage children playing together outside. Maybe we can, parents can try to coordinate play dates more, especially those parents that might have an only child. You know, having a play date, I think, can bridge so many gaps. So I totally agree with that. Um, difficulty getting there, so the transportation issue, and the cost as well. So, well, we know that there are many free physical activities, but things like bike riding, you have to buy a bike in order to and go bike riding. And someone has to teach you. And someone has to teach you. Rollerblading, you would need the rollerblade. And someone also has to teach you. But there are some free activities that, that you can focus on if cost is an issue. Mm -hmm. Don't know where I can do the activities, as well as there are other reasons. So some of the things in a normal week that most children should be able to access, some children won't want to hear this, but walking to and from school is excellent exercise. Oh dear, I was just explaining to Dr. Lawrence that that's a sacrilege, <laughs> but it's doable. Uh, sport or activities outside of school, which we touched on as well. Physical education in school, as well as other play activities. So let's go to the next slide. And we'll talk a little bit about how to prevent childhood obesity. The, some of the core actions that I would want everyone to take away from this presentation this evening, with the portion sizes that are appropriate for children, managing treat foods like sweets, chips, and chocolates, uh, replacing sugary drinks with water or less sugary drinks, being more physically activity, active, reducing screen time and encouraging children to get enough sleep. I mean, it's important too that parents can come up with fun ways to m introduce and to maintain um, the intake of fruits and vegetables. Like for instance, for the ones that can afford, can invest in a, a dehydrator mm -hmm. where you, um, you, you dry the fruits. Mm -hmm. And so you can have dry fruit snacks. And I think that's a viable option because then when you take out the moisture of of the fruits, it tends to concentrate the sweetness, the sugars in, this, in the fruits more. So I think that can supplement for their sugar, their sugar craving or whatever the case is. That's true, healthier um, sugar options are and key. healthy snacks, maybe you can do homemade granola. Because sweets are addictive for adults, much less you children. Know, for children. It's very difficult for a child to say no to sweets. So having options there that are, that, that fulfill that craving without being overwhelmingly unhealthy. And I know some it's parents an have idea. experience in doing smoothies. You can make smoothies for the children too, fruit smoothies, make it... Fruit smoothies, yeah. dried fruit, um, nuts and fruit blends, less a trail mix. And yeah, and even homemade granola, that's a granola. thing. Granola. That's a thing you can do for them. So yeah, we so have options. So it doesn't options. always have to be candy, parents. We can, we can look at other ways that allow them to fulfill that sweet craving. We can talk about um, the portion sizes as well. 
you know, no nine-year-old needs to eat the same amount as a, a full-grown adult. adult. Mm -hmm. So being aware of how much it is appropriate for a child to eat for their age, and as we said, what the appropriate size is for their age, would be very helpful as well. Do you have any thoughts on our action plan? Well, for sure, we need to encourage these children. I find parents also, back in the day, it was a must that you have a bedtime. I find a lot of parents don't really enforce a bedtime, so there's no structure, and structure is important because then it gets the body and the metabolism accustomed and used to a routine. So sleep is a big part of that, and sleep now would um, help you to metabolize your food um, a lot easier. So we'll touch on more of these things after a quick commercial break. Join us on ZIZ TV for Youth Lounge with Skanaipo, a talk show on vital topics such as tourism, entrepreneurship, education, religion, sex education, and mental health. Featuring experts from St. Kitts and Nevis and the Caribbean region. Tune in live on the first and third Wednesday of every month at 8.30 p.m. on ZIZ TV. Another day in the box. Well, hello, dear. Ooh, she pretty from head to toe, and are you ready to go? <laughs> Wait there. Can't afford to sleep up, not even in my dreams. Good evening, and welcome back to Healthwise. We're discussing childhood obesity this evening. We were discussing physical activity. I'd like to go a little bit further into our talk about diet now. If you could go to uh, slide 10, we'll talk a little bit about what a healthy plate is. So here we have a plate that's into three places, fruit and vegetables, our starch, and our protein are the basic elements of our healthy plate and as we see we should be having just as much vegetables as we are starches some of the star the fruits and vegetables we have here are carrots bananas onions tomatoes grapes all of those things are healthy options for children in terms of starches we have our bread rice potatoes and we have our local versions as well our fig our yam or sweet potato, which is, tends to be a lot healthier than having bread every time. And our healthy protein sources. We have chicken, but we don't have to che eat chicken every day. We can have less red meat, less processed meat, more <coughs> fish, um, more beans, more vegetarian sources of protein as well. What are your thoughts on the food plate, Dr. Lesko? Well, I've long been very curious about the way how it's not just here in the in St. Kitts, but the, across the Caribbean, for instance, even as an infant, if you have like a really small child, um, I find in the Federation here we tend to rely a lot on the the canned milk. No, sorry, not the the powdered the powdered milk for for children. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder how come we don't do more of the planting porridge or the green or ripe planting porridge because I was only introduced to that when I traveled out to Jamaica yes oh yes they have every type of porridge you can imagine so I imagine. think that is for me 
I think that's a better option for young mothers instead of killing themselves to be able to afford these can this, this powdered milk that is full of all kind of things that no one probably is able to vouch for. And the sugary cereals that yes. go along with it as yes, well. Yes, because I find um, the youths them here tend to see porridge as old people food. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is really strength for them, especially if you're giving them things like green banana porridge. Do you know how much, you know how much energy and strength is in that? And yes. it's, it, it won't put on a lot of excess fat. And then it, it also functions as an excellent alternative for the bread and the rice that we rely so mm -hmm. heavily on. I personally prefer the Jamaican um, methods of eating. Yes, especially <laughs> when it comes to children. I find they tend to give the children a lot more ground food, a lot more power food. And I even, I even heard um, Hussein Bolt touch on that. He big on his bread food. And, and his yam. yam. Oh my. <laughs> and he's so, made that quite famous. Yes. So, so, I mean, why can't we take a page out of their book? With, we're the same climate in the same area. So why, why don't we borrow from our Caribbean and brothers and sisters? And it's important to know that's often a lot more affordable yes. um, than some of the other options. Yes, you can easily, if, even if you can afford a, 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 the can of the powdered milk. So sometimes your neighbor have a hand of fig as a young mother. I'm sure if you have good relationship with your neighbor, they give you the hand of fig, you have to find creative ways to make your food for your children. I totally agree. On the other side, in terms of what you should limit in a healthy diet, uh, snack foods, foods with added sugars such as cakes and desserts, um, foods that are high in fat, salt and sugar, it's important to limit those as well, as well as uh, high fat foods which contains a lot of oil, butter or spreads. So the top tips we have from our little uh, infographic here, get your five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, try to have two portions of fish per week, eat more beans and lentils and other plant-based proteins, and keep treat foods to small portions. Can you stick a thumbnail there? Sure, when I was right in ahead. Barbados, for instance, you know what they did with peas, and I've never seen it done here? Maybe what we need to do is invest in a mill where you can take your raw material and grind it. You know what I saw them make in Barbados? They made flour out of peas, dried oh, peas. Yes, yes. And that was a very nutritious um, alternative to make Johnny Cakes with. So then high in protein. Have very high in protein. So um, it was a Rastafarian movement group that I was a part of there. So they taught me different alternative ways to cook different foods. And so it was a creative experience for me. I know how to do the Johnny Cakes with the, the um, any different type of flour you can think of and that was something they were very much invested in so I thought by now we would have caught on here but since we haven't I'm putting it out there that yes. there are other experiment other with your healthy foods it doesn't have to be yes. white flour and it doesn't just have peas doesn't just mean I tell stew mm. there's a lot of different ways to incorporate healthy foods mm -hmm. in ways that your children will enjoy mm -hmm. so let's not cross those foods off of the list mm -hmm. let's go to the next slide just a little um, summary of what we've been talking about. Avoid the excess fat, sugar, and salt. And realize a lot of the children are not having enough fruits and vegetables. So creative ways to get the, your children to choose those foods is important. The other thing about fruits and vegetables, which I haven't mentioned, is the intake of vitamins and minerals, mm -hmm. um, which is important for healthy growth and development in your children and will keep them feeling more satisfied as well so they're not frequently snacking. And then the intake of fiber is important with these plant foods as well. Let's go on to the next slide. We touched it in briefly, but inequality and obesity. Let's talk about how cheap these convenience foods are sometimes. What are your thoughts, Dr. Lescott? Well, cheap is a very relative word, you know, because it's cheap now, but then what if your child becomes very ill because of such a lifestyle, and then now cheap now becomes very expensive, and cheap now becomes something that you didn't foresee coming and it's out of your range even though it was cheap because then now your six-year-old your seven-year-old has um, juvenile diabetes and now you're forced and you're 
forced into a position to buy those foods that you once thought was too expensive to buy. And in addition to buying medicine for that child. Of course. And then... Um, so that's a double hit. It's important that all of the adults, and I know this is difficult, but if you're going to be regimented with the child then it means the adults in the house also have to be disciplined and regimented as well and I think that is one of the major challenges is to it's one thing to regiment and put a child in um, discipline so to speak like you discipline them in a particular way but you yourself as a parent or the caretakers or the people who reside in the home around the child it's important for them to also that's so important <laughs> Dr. Lescott because Let's be real here. Your children will eat what Whatever you eat, you eat yep. what is available to them. If it's not available to them, most of the time they will not eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that you model healthy behaviors for your child. We're going to take a quick break and discuss. We're going to go to see our new segment with Dr. Jensen Morton, the Director of Health Institutions for the Joseph N. Friend Hospital. He will discuss with us just a little bit about what's been happening there. After that, we'll go to a commercial break and we'll be right back to end this night's episode of HealthWise. I'm Dr. Jensen Wharton. I'm the Director of Health Institutions and today we're at the Cardin Hall. So the department, which is the Institution-Based Health Services, it consists of four institutions in St. Kitts, JNF General Hospital, Hogson Hospital, the Mary Charles Hospital, and also the Cardin Hall. And although a lot of people focus very strongly on JNF General Hospital because it is the largest subsidiary in the entire Department of Institution-Based Health Services, the Cardin Home is also something that is our primary responsibility. So the Cardin Home is located here, right in the village, just down the road from the hospital. And sometimes it suffers from a bit of neglect, um, not habitually in most occasions, but simply because it tends to be its own world and its own entity. And a lot of times, since it's tightly intertwined with charities, um, persons in the past would have just allowed the charity organizations to really take the lead with regards to aspects of its maintenance and upkeep. JNF General Hospital staff decided to reach out to the Ministry of Constituency Empowerment and they very generously decided to partner with us to get one project ongoing, which is a project just to paint and refresh the external side of the garden home, just so that it's a more pleasant place. The environs having that refreshment, it actually can do a lot for the psyche of the persons that live here, as well as for persons in the surrounding communities to view it more as a place that gets the respect that it deserves. Now, that's not the only thing that's happening here. We have instituted physiotherapy for the first time in the Cardin home, and there's actually a full-blown physiotherapist that is here full-time to ensure that the residents of the Cardin home are able to get the necessary amounts of exercise. For the first time as well, we have a licensed nutritionists um, at the Cardin home such that the person that are there can get properly tapered diets depending on the background situation in terms of their medical situation, types of medications that they're taking, etc. All of the staff members um, that assist patients, they now are fully certified persons from the current Swissroy Bryant College's elder care course, and that's now a prerequisite to become a care attendant at the Cardin Home, which is something that was also recently implemented for the sake of the safety and well-being of the patients that are here. There's some construction that's taking place on the western part of the Cardin Home, where we have a unit that we house some individuals that are a little bit more disruptive than the rest and thus they need to be kept um, in places with a little bit more individualization and isolation. That entire unit is now being redone for the first time since its original construction way back in the early 1900s. It's finally now being redone such that it can be up to the level of international standards. So the Cardin Home is not a place that we're forgetting and as we continue to improve it, we'll ensure to keep the general public up to date with the developments. Thank you.
Good evening and welcome back to HealthWise. I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Monique Letscott, and we're having a discussion about childhood obesity in the Caribbean this evening and in St. Kitts. Let's take a look at our last slide, our conclusions. So we mentioned how important childhood obesity is as an issue in the Caribbean. Uh, we didn't discuss the prevalence though, Dr. Lescott. So it tends to be slightly higher in girls than boys. So we actually have about 30% of girls being overweight or obese and about 24% of boys. Boy, women has always have it harder from <laughs> since we're small. So it's difficult to say what issues contribute to that. I think it's the socializing of girls to be quiet and be still and they're less likely than the boys to be out roughhousing and tumbling and playing mm -hmm. football and playing. Mm -hmm. So I think the activity in girls might be contributing to that. Do you have any thoughts? I mean, that's interesting because I mean, at least, and I hate to be sounding old because I'm not old, but I don't hear much about after school activities with girls anymore. We, I mean, there was the girl guides and the brownies, so which was the female equivalent to Cub Scouts. Oh, those are still um, pretty still active in They're the Caribbean, active. yes. So then I'm not exactly sure why um, female, like young girls would um, tend to gain weight more. That's something that I've never really looked at. Uh, as you say, maybe it's because girls have a tendency to, I guess, be more sedentary. Or I was also wondering if it's a matter of metabolism where I think it's some sort of literature somewhere that kind of states that men tend to burn calories easier. Their metabolism is faster. That they, is true. They metabolize easier. So, I mean, a little boy can maybe burn off calories easier than a little girl. I think it's genetic sometimes. Yes, I think there's definitely some um, factors that are from the genes of each respective group. So, we have that high prevalence, which as I said, has been going up a little bit every year. So, it's important for all of us to take note of that fact and do everything that we can to encourage our children to be healthier. So we've talked a little bit about some of the factors that lead to obesity and a lot of the things that we can do to counteract that. It's not just about cutting down the food, but also what they eat, when they eat, and the nutrition value of what they eat. Keeping active and ensure the children are, have everything they need to grow and develop healthily. I agree as well and um, the parents definitely have to also watch what they eat in front of their little ones because they have to practice what they preach. They have to also um, be the example that they want their child to follow in terms of what they intake into their bodies. So maybe I've seen persons where they would um, try to hide and sneak a candy bar when the child isn't looking. <laughs> Like um, they might wait until after hours when the child is that's already um, in bed to indulge. I mean, that's an option, but it's just important to emulate what you want to see in your child. So then you can't be having um, high calorie snacks in the house and then be upset if the child partakes or sneaks away some. It's unfair. It's a, bit, it's a big temptation. That's true. And you can't bring home KFC every day and then <laughs> expect good health. Or even to, to in the event of um, lunches, you can't give children money to buy their lunch in the hopes that they will choose a healthy option. Most likely if you give them money, they're going to go and buy chicken and chips, they're going to buy the pizza, they're going to buy the fried chicken, you know. So um, maybe it's better for you to make the, act the sacrifice and maybe wake up a half hour earlier before the family and mm, pack the meals and prep for the lunch. day. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult in our modern day. We all know that time is an issue for everyone. But if you do have a child that's struggling with this issue, it's important to take an active role and model good behaviors and do everything that you can because it really does start at home. Uh, and that is the most important aspect in these situations. For me, it's important. I've always thought for us in St. Kitts especially, we can um, take some a page out of the books out of um, other Caribbean islands and to just utilize the resources that we have 
um, like I mentioned before, and you mentioned, and I forgot to mention, things like peanut porridge. Um, even You can even do breadfruit porridge. You can do green banana porridge, plantain porridge. There's a lot of healthy alternatives that you can choose besides store-bought things. We have the resources here, but I think sometimes we lack the creativity and sometimes it takes for someone else to kickstart an idea for it to become more prevalent and popular. But we have the resources here to innovate enough to um, just not have to be dependent too much heavily on the chemically filled and processed foods in the supermarket. I'm very afraid of those for children. And I think it's been proven. It's, we're seeing it every day in, in how it's affecting our children. The more you rely on these things, the more your children are likely to have these, these issues. I think white rice. White rice is one of the worst things. White rice literally is a huge problem. Like It's a precursor to a lot of issues. So if we can just have choose other alternatives to like I said, the store-bought process bleached, like they bleach out the rice, they bleach the flour, so there's hardly any nutritional value in them. So then why not choose an option that you can know where the source of it is coming from? Yes. But it's not all bleak. I mean, 30% of children obese still means that 70% of them are doing fairly well. But if your, your child has this issue, then I would listen keenly and see what can be done. And but remember thing, that it starts at home. Another thing we didn't touch on was sometimes what some persons would experience in weight gain is joint problems. Yes, that's true That's as well. a huge issue and so sometimes maybe that's why the child might find it difficult now to do physical activities because their joints are hurting. They're going to have um, respiratory issues. So can you imagine it's a very uncomfortable state to be in. And it's a snowball effect. The less, the more uncomfortable they are, the less they move, the less they move, the more weight they will gain and then we have a, a snowball effect going on and they and end up very worse off than they need to be. And it's very difficult to identify depression in children. Sometimes it's very easily passed off as just having a melancholy personality. When if you really just stop to examine and maybe take that child out of that environment, maybe change their diet a bit, you will see a difference in that child. And depression in children, that's really when they should be building, growing, learning their skills for life. So it can have a lifelong impact. Definitely. It sets the tone for them even in their adolescent years. It, it sets a platform and sometimes some of them remain on that trajectory even until upon like past the age of 18 so I think that's quite sad so we need to do ourselves and our children a huge favor and to just try to consider alternative um, ways of preparing our foods and with that that's the end of our show thank you so much for tuning in this evening as we spoke about childhood obesity I hope everyone was able to get some new and important information that they can use to help their families or the people around them. Thank you so much and good night.